Well, good afternoon. Uh, we'll go ahead and start as people are trickling in. Um, we'll go ahead and start the uh, presentation here. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Gore, Director of Community Development here for the Asian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, welcome to our Business Resilience Series, November 11, 2020. The Asian Chamber has been monitoring the COVID-19 situation in January, affecting our Asian business here in Houston, and happy to put together a wonderful webinar with our partner, National Ace. This webinar is the last of a four-part series focusing on legal, communication, human resource, and cybersecurity. But before I continue, please welcome Janet representing National Ace, who has graciously collaborated and been supportive with our Business Resilience Series, as well as a recent ACC Business Conference and Expo we did last month. Janet? Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. And happy Veterans Day to everybody that serves um, our country. Again, I'm Janet Alekpala. I'm the project manager at the Asian Pacific Islander American Chamber of Commerce and Entrepreneurship, also known as National Ace. We're a national nonprofit organization whose mission is to serve as a strong advocate of AAPI business interests and affect positive change on all issues that enhance and advance the goals and aspirations of AAPI business owners. For the past six months, we've worked closer than ever with all of our national network of over uh, 60 affiliate chambers of commerce across the country to ensure that the AAPI business community has the most accurate and up-to-date information about the important resources that are available to our community during this global pandemic. Our strongest partnerships is with the Houston Asian Chamber of Commerce. And we're really grateful to Bin Yu, Paul Gore and Barbara Gallo for providing this space for this discussion today and allowing us to have an interactive forum on this very important issue of cybersecurity and building a more resilient organization with featured keynote speaker, David Grady from Verizon Business Group. His discussion on keeping your business's cybersecurity plans up to date is so important to many of our businesses that are shifting into more of a digital environment. We're also proud to partner with the Houston Asian Chamber of Commerce on today's event, and we're working together on additional collaborations in the near future and beyond. As many of you know, we are just starting to see data on the impact of COVID-19 and what it has done to the AAPI business community. A recent report by JP Morgan Chase shows that the balances of Asian owned businesses declined by 22% in April. At the end of March, revenues for AAPI businesses were over 60% lower than they were in the prior year. Overall, Asian owned businesses have experienced severe damage to cash balances and revenues, and they're going to require more assistance from the federal government to fully recover. As many federal assistance programs have since stalled, we know that additional targeted interventions will be necessary for the small businesses that have been hit the hardest to continue. National ACE has instituted a program to help tackle many of these issues, including helping individual businesses with financial assistance, as well as helping individual businesses restart their operations safely and strategically. If your business is in need on one of one, uh, is in need of one-on-one -on -one business consulting or other resources, contact us through our website at asmallbusiness.org. I will put that in the chat today. We have hired certified business consultants that are ready and willing to help all business entrepreneurs at any level. And best of all, our services are free of charge and we're here to help. Again, thank you for having us on this discussion today. And a big thank you to Ben, Paul, Barbara, and David and the team at Houston Asian Chamber of Commerce for hosting this great event. We're looking forward to hearing about this discussion today. Thanks for, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you, Janet. You know, you, you are uh, very instrumental and, and without your support uh, and all the, the series that we've had, uh, we appreciate just the amount of contribution and even more time and devotions uh, and being able to uh, put up programs like this. And, and so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce uh, David. Today, we're happy to have David Grady, Chief Security Evangelist at Verizon Business Group, who has provided resources and best practice for keeping uh, your business and customers safe from bad actors. Uh, David joined Verizon Cybersecurity uh, product and management team back in 2015, and since been advocating um, being safe on a digital world by being mindful of how you conduct your business online and protecting um, yourself. I also hope that you find this presentation conversation useful in keeping your information safe through these times with COVID. The, the Asian Chamber of Commerce is an organization celebrating 30 years helping the Asian business community to foster economic trades among our members. And this is a very crucial time and opportunity to learn resources for you to help your business. 
But before we continue with the webinar, I would like to just kind of provide some housekeeping items. Uh, we'll have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, you can ask your questions with the Q&A chat box in the control panel located in the lower portion of your screen. If you have any questions or in the middle of the webinar, please submit your questions there. Uh, note, we'll try to answer all the questions asked, but please forgive us if um, we're unable to because of time constraints. Just wanna let you know ahead of time Lastly, the presentation will be recorded, so please stay engaged uh, because there's going to be a lot of information covered and with a short amount of time. So beforehand, um, before I turn it over to David, I'm just going to just share with you about one upcoming program that we're having next week. Um, it's going to be our speed um, networking cocktail party. It's the one way where you can really meet um, other like-minded business owners and um, be able to collaborate. You'll have five minutes to talk to each person. Um, it's gonna be random uh, matching where you can definitely have a conversation. It's gonna be an hour long, it's free and it's limited. So please sign up uh, to attend. And we ask that if you do sign up, please attend uh, as we have a, a limited number of seats available for that opportunity. Um, and the other thing is just to remind you, we have a new website and app that we launched back in June one way to really be engaged and to be able to see what's happening and also engage with opportunities uh, for your business. So please check it out and download. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it to David and go ahead and do the presentation. David? Thank you so much, Paul. Appreciate you having me here. And uh, if it goes well, maybe you'll have me back next year and we can do it in person, which would really I'm sure. Nice. Okay, go ahead. But in the interim, to share screen. <laughs> I'm going to share a screen. I'm going to stop my video. I'm going to jump over and I'm going to start my talk. Uh, hopefully everyone can see cybersecurity and the resilient organization. So yeah, it's all about resiliency this year, isn't it? Um, we've been hearing that word a lot lately in, in addition to terms like challenging times. Um, and sometimes it can make your head hurt, but resiliency is so important. It was before COVID and it will remain so after COVID. Um, when I think about resiliency, I really think about, um, you know, sort of what it means is um, how your organization can bend but not break and how, how it can withstand those many different pressures that make it bend. Um, everything uh, from, from COVID uh, to cyber criminals to just plain old competition can put a tremendous amount of pressure on your organization and its ability to thrive and, and survive. Um, David, your, your screen is not shared. Oh, okay. I apologize for that. Thank you. No problem. Share screen. Now it is. Yes? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Just don't mind me, I'm just a technical guy. <laughs> um, so as I was saying, yeah, so resiliency is, is gonna be important to the organization, you know, no matter no matter how we come all out of this uh, at the end, but it's it's a, that ability to, to withstand unexpected things and to plan for unexpected things um, and be able to bounce back. And cybersecurity plays a really important role in, the, in that ability to be resilient. Um, and cybersecurity obviously has become more important than ever. In case you're wondering about what Verizon is or does, um, you may know us as a wireless company. Uh, you may have seen our ads for 5G, uh, 5G networking. We are a large networking company, obviously, and, and the big wireless. Uh, but we've been doing cybersecurity for companies on behalf of our customers for about 20 years now. Uh, we continue to innovate and invest in our security capabilities, and we help a lot of organizations um, you know, get their security programs to where they need to be, and not just in the giant enterprises, global enterprises, but also in the smaller medium space. So, you know, um, you know, the world is changing, as we all know. And I don't know if, if you've had any opportunity in your business to evaluate or even implement some of these technologies, but these things are real and they've gone from sort of buzzword to business ready, things like the Internet of Things, where you've got devices that can uh, help your organization, you know, more efficiently manage supply chain or, or run a lab or, or just, you know, more efficiently, you know, keep the temperatures and the light costs down, things like that. These are getting more real every day. Uh, virtual and augmented reality, we've seen such a, uh, an explosion of that, not just with 5G behind it, but for the need for it. Um, think about the applications during COVID. Think about the virtual real estate, you know, walkthrough uh, if you're a realtor. Think about the, um, you know, the other applications that come from not being able to have customers in your, in, into your store or into your place of business how can you showcase your wares? A lot of organizations are embracing that kind of innovation. Things like intelligent video and smart communities, these are all emerging technologies that may seem like they're happening over there, but you as a business that wants to thrive need to start to understand the impact. Now, all of these technologies have amazing um, benefits. Um, the real upside uh, is high, but the, with that comes the flip side, which is the potential risk. 
that's why it's so important to think about security as a business enabler. Um, when we talk about business enabler as security, I've worked in cybersecurity for about 15 years. And when I first started, security was always called the department of saying no, because you, someone would say, can you help me do this? And we would say no, because that's not secure. Security has evolved a lot in the last 10 years, last five years to actually an organization and a function in, in companies that help organizations, help business leaders do the things they need to do, not get in the way. It's an enabler for real. And we see this with our customers. So when you think about how security plays into things like enabling resiliency, right? Um, everything from um, the unexpected shutdown of, of a company because of COVID or, or at least the operations and moving to virtual so many people have moved to you know, working from home, working from remote locations and the security implications that come with that. Um, if, you, if, you, if you think about that in advance and, and look at it from a security perspective or through the security lens, you should know that you, know, you, need, you needed to enable things like a virtual private network or more secure ways for your people to connect to your network and to conduct business in a, in a safer way. The, the ability to innovate, you were innovating before COVID, you will innovate again, but the things that you're doing to innovate, to redesign your business processes, to redesign the technology that enables those things, um, security has to be a part of those, that planning and that conversation when you're considering bringing in innovative technologies, innovative um, new ways of doing business. The, um, organizations too often wait till the, the end of the launch of something new and shiny and, and very game changing to think about the security and many organizations find that if they think about security too late, that, that puts a major um, cramp in their ability to, to proceed with what they're trying to do. Security has to be up front. Uh, a lot of organizations might be thinking about moving to the cloud. They might be tempted by what they hear about the cloud uh, and about the efficiencies, the cost efficiencies, and, and some of the, um, uh, the, the sort of the lowering uh, need for to, to maintain all the equipment on, on site and to have all the people doing that, the, the cloud is very attractive uh, from, a, from a financial perspective. And the security that comes with that or doesn't come with that move has to be uh, evaluated as you're making that decision. Um, the cloud is not inherently 100% secure, nor is it, nor is it terrible. It's, it's just like any other thing that you need to protect. Um, and as you move from you know, the old way of doing business to mobile applications and mobile devices and, 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 uh, and cloud and such, um, and web applications and online payment systems, you clearly obviously need to be thinking about security. We're going to talk about all these things today. And then finally, you know, being resilient also means knowing when to take risks and when knowing when not to take risks. Uh, a calculated risk literally means that you are calculating the odds of success or understanding the impact of a negative impact. Security can help an organization make decisions about where to spend its money or where not to spend its money to secure itself or to minimize risk if it understands the risks that it wants to accept and, and the, the, the appetite or the tolerance that it has for risks, uh, certain types of risks. And, um, and, and all of this really comes down to digital transformation. Digital transformation, again, used to be a buzzword from, from, from our perspective now. Many, many, many companies are on this journey for digital transformation uh, and security has to be <laughs> a part of that. Now, that said, I didn't grow up as a technology guy. I was not a um, computer person at all in my career uh, or, or in my education, um, but I got interested in it, but I came from a, like I was an English major and a journalism student. Um, but the, the, what I found is that if you let security as a concept, right, as a, as a science um, overwhelm you, or, or if you think it's so incredibly specialized, it, of course it's specialized like any other specialty, but it's not some you know, magical science that only the, the, you know, the, the real experts can talk about and understand security is, just like any other part of your business. And you don't have to be overwhelmed by the, I mean, cause there really are a lot of weeds in it. There's a million, million and one things that you need to do maybe in security. But the truth is you don't need to do all of those million and one things. There's a million and one things you can do, but you don't have to do them all. As a business leader, I'm asking you to think about these four things that fundamentally should guide the decisions you make about how much time and energy and resource you put in security. I want you to think about how these four outcomes, these four sort of these capabilities and security um, will, will influence your decision making. So the first thing you need to know is, is understanding, the vis having visibility into your risk. And I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about some of the tools that Verizon has developed that are free and that are not, no, no hooks attached that you can use to understand uh, cyber risk to, specific to your industry. But knowing what your risks are 
uh, internally and externally. That means you can plan for them. Now, this is a goofy example, but you know, if your headquarters is right next to a major train station, like a big Amtrak station, it's very likely that your disaster recovery plan probably has a scenario about the train going off the track, heaven forbid, right? But because that's a likely risk, you're going to plan for, or possible risk, you're going to plan for the eventuality of a train accident, you know, shutting down your building, right? Knowing the cybersecurity attack methods that the bad guys use against companies like yours helps you decide which ones to focus on and which not. So to stretch that a little bit further, if your headquarters is 500 miles away from the nearest train track, you are not going to put a train derailment hitting your building into your disaster recovery plan. You're not going to spend weeks developing a disaster recovery plan for that train because it's just probably not going to happen. The, 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 the information that I'm going to share with you today gets you on the start of this journey and this, down this path of understanding specifically what the risks are. Some risks are internal. That means that employees might be looking to quit next week and steal all of the competitive information. But not all employees are bad. So some internal risk might be that you have them working on computers that aren't up to date or that your business processes are really manually intensive or too paper intensive. And maybe, you know, private information, sensitive information might go out in the trash uh, out back of the building that people can dumpster dive. It sounds silly, but it happens. So knowing external threats, knowing the, why the bad guys would come after you and how they would come after you and also partners. Um, many companies out there, and you probably as well, have relationships with vendors and other partners who might be touching your customer data or might be touching your systems in some way. Um, the, you know, the, the go-to example of third-party risk is that major, um, that major retailer. Uh, I can name it because we worked on it and, and the investigator from Verizon was actually testified in front of Congress. We don't like to talk about a, a, you know, a customer that got hit, but the target breach was brought on by a third-party vendor who worked on the, um, on the HVAC system, right? So they had an unsecure system, that third party, that allowed a bad guy to get into the target system and wreak havoc on target, cost them a lot of money and a lot of reputational damage. So you have to know what that risk is. And I'm gonna show you how to start figuring out what that risk is. The second thing you have to do is protect the attack surface. And what that means is all of the devices that your company relies on to do your job, which is the laptops that your people are working from at home or in the office, or the servers that hold information, or the tablets that you put out on the road with your people, or the, or the cell phones and mobile phones, smartphones and such, or the cloud, if you are moving into the cloud. All of those, picture a football field filled with all of those devices. That's your attack surface. And every time you add things to that football field, another, another server or another 55 iPhones or 26 Android phones or whatever, that attack surface expands, the football field gets bigger, and you need to be able to protect that. I'm going to show you a little bit about how to start thinking about that as well. The ability to detect and respond to an attack faster is critical. In our research, we find that um, most organizations don't realize that someone has broken in and is still in their network for weeks and sometimes months and even up to a year, which is a long time to think about in the real world if someone broke into your house and they're sneaking around looking in your drawers and going through your medicine cabinets and looking for your stuff. Imagine they're in the house for like eight months. That's not good. And that's what happens with a, too many, um, too many organizations, they, they can't detect that and they can't respond. Um, so that's, that's a, um, a, a decision that you have to make about um, what, your, what your appetite is to, to pay to have that done uh, in a faster way. And then minimizing the impact and quickly restoring operations. When bad things happen, say like COVID and you had to, um, you had to shift gears and change the way that you, you know, the operating hours or how many people you could have in the building or touchless payment systems or any of that stuff. With cybersecurity, it's the same thing. You need to have a plan it says, if we get hit by our ransomware, and you probably all heard about ransomware, um, which is becoming a bigger, bigger deal every day, you know, what is our plan? The last thing you want to do uh, when you have a problem like a breach or, or, or malware event, um, or if you find yourself under attack, is to, is to figure it out in real time. You want to be able to have that plan in advance. So when you think about these four outcomes, these four things, this is, you can get your head around this, right? And you're not talking about reverse engineering malware, and you're not talking about trying to be as cool as the people in that Mr. Robot show or war games, however old you are. Um, but it's about thinking of security as a business enabler, thinking about security as an asset to your organization. What I want to do now is, is sort of transition into some of the tools that we've developed to help you do the things that I've talked about here. 
Verizon puts out these reports every year, uh, several other reports as well. And again, all of these reports are not advertising. I promise you there's no fluffery marketing stuff in here. These are data-driven reports and they're not just like regurgitating textbooks. These aren't written for just security people. These are written for business leaders. These are written for influencers in organizations, people in the privacy department or the legal department or the HR department, or just to run a business line or department in your organization to help understand these reports make security real. They're written in a language that's really accessible. They're written in a language that um, assumes that you are a smart person, but doesn't assume that you've gone to school for security. Um, the first report is called the Data Breach Investigations Report. And this really goes to that first thing that I mentioned earlier when I said, enhance your visibility of risk, knowing what the bad guys are up to in your industry. So in this, this report, the Data Breach Investigation Report, which we call the DBIR, I'm in Boston, so we call it the DBIR. The DBIR um, looks at every year, we collect from um, partners all over the world, law enforcement, uh, government agencies, private organizations, information about actual data breaches and actual cyber attacks. And we, we kind of, we do like an autopsy on, on all of the attacks. Um, it, this is not hypothetical stuff. This is not textbook best practice stuff. We look at thousands and thousands of security incidents and we look at what, the, the, what happened. We look at who the bad guy was. Was it a partner? Was it an external actor? Were they backed by a, a mafia in some, in some country somewhere else? Were they backed by a government in some, some, uh, some country other than the US? Um, were they uh, internal people who did stupid things or did things because they, they, they felt that the controls had gotten in the way and they had to do a workaround which brought a security risk? Uh, and then we look at the actual data breaches um, uh, that because that, 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 there's a difference between an event, which you know makes everybody in security go crazy, and a data breach, which means that you know something got stolen. Um, when we look at this information, first we look at it at a high level. So this is where you start thinking about the risks that are most likely to happen. And that's the key for me is when I talk to folks like you and team uh, and organizations like yours, learn about what's more likely to happen. That way you don't have to worry about everything and anything that can happen. So you know that at, at across all industries, more than two thirds of attacks or data breaches result from three types of attacks. Having your credentials stolen, people who have their username and login stolen. Um, sometimes that happens when you get a fake email from Netflix or from some other provider that says, you know, your, 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 your account's been shut down, you need to re-enter your, your information. Um, and you give them your, your name and your password and they, they steal it. Um, errors, mistakes, uh, that could be anything from the way a cloud um, site is, is, is secured or configured um, to people with literally fat fingers sending the wrong email to the wrong person. Uh, and then social attacks are um, sort of highly engineered uh, attacks that are sometimes known as phishing, P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, phishing, um, which goes after people uh, based on a little bit of research to find out who they are and why they might click on things. A big headline from the report this year, though, is that more than a quarter of malware incidents are ransomware. And I assume you've heard of ransomware. It keeps popping up on the news. Um, all sorts of organizations are getting hit. That's when somebody clicks on something and the entire network gets encrypted and you get the, the, the little ghost face comes up and says, we will release your systems from being uh, held hostage by us if you pay us you know, $10,000 in, in, in Bitcoin or some other uh, cryptocurrency. Um, that ransomware is, is, is growing every day. Uh, every day you see more of it in the headlines and it really speaks to the need to uh, prepare for the possibility of that from a number of different perspectives. Very quickly, some other stats, you know, personal data is, is the thing that bad guys always go after, or at least in more than half the time. Um, web applications, if you're using web applications to power your business or work with your customers or service your customers, the attacks on those are growing more and more and your provider, your either in-house team or the web application developers, you need to be able to challenge them to demonstrate that they are coding in a way or, or configuring in a way that is secure. You don't necessarily have to read the code, but you need to ask the question, how confident are you that what you've given me is secure and how, do you, how can you prove it to me? And then uh, errors, as I said, uh, that, that keeps going up, um, which, is, which talks about business process um, you know, as well. Like one thing is, I, I always think about the times when you send an email to uh, a number of people and sometimes the email auto populates and it adds the wrong you know john jones or the wrong you know mary smith uh and, and that wrong person gets it that's a data breach that's a data breach so um this report looks specifically at about 20 industries 
And I'm going to show you an example of, of why this is important to you. So if you look in the left-hand column, you know, pick one of these industries that you're in. You might be in healthcare, you might be in financial, you might be in education, any of these. Uh, could be, you know, uh, retail, um, transportation, warehousing. What we do is we, we, we look at the victims of cyber attacks from the real cyber attacks, the thousands that we saw last year. And then we break it up into, into each one. So as an example, in this report, you can see that in the financial and, and insurance industry, the attack patterns last year and the, from the thousands that we looked at, okay, were, you can see the patterns, right? So web applications were the most common. So if you're in financial services or insurance and you rely on a lot of web applications, know that that is the number one likely target. That gives you the opportunity to at least start to sort of scope out your security program, right? You don't wanna have to spend too much time and money on all these other things that could go wrong when you know that web applications are a big part of it. When you look at the threat actors, right? You know that 64% are external, so you need to have strong defenses, strong boundary defenses, right? And that's gonna inform the decisions you make about your network security and such. But look at this, in 35% of the 1500 security incidents and in the 500 confirmed data breaches that we looked at in this industry, 35% of them were internal actors. And that means anything, as I said, from someone who did a workaround because they wanted to work on that spreadsheet this weekend at home. So they sent it to their Google email and had all this confidential information to people who are looking at information that they shouldn't have access to, but they do have access to, or they don't need to look at it. Um, people who are quitting and maybe want to steal the information, people who have been compromised. Um, and sometimes it's just mistakes. Sometimes the business processes that they use to move information from point A to point B can uh, be fraught with um, security, um, you know, potential compromise. Um, you know, why are we, why do some organizations still rely on fax machines? I'm kind of riffing here right now, but recently, you know, I had to get my youngest kid a, a, a doctor referral and they was like, can you fax the documentation over? And I did it three times from the local copy place and they kept losing it because on the other end is a fax machine in the middle of a crowded room. God knows where that documentation went. That is technically a HIPAA violation. So think about the business processes that you have in place to share information with your customers. Do you need to build and innovate and build a, <clears throat> like a secure document transfer system, right? You know, you don't just send, you know, uh, closing information for a real estate purchase, you know, to someone's Hotmail account, right? You got to send it in a, in a more secure um, method, right? So, the, so these, again, should, knowing, the, knowing who the threat actors are and what their motives are, financial motivation and such, and the kinds of inf information that they stole helps you. The really cool thing about this report, the Data Breach Investigation Report, again, it's free for download. We'll make sure you guys, get, I'll show you where it is. But the bottom thing here says top controls. These are critical security controls that come from an organization called the Center for Information Security. But these are the top three things in financial services and insurance that you should focus on to greatly improve your security posture. It's not gonna be a magic bullet, but if you implement a security awareness and training program for your employees and you do it right, not just once a year, check the box and they're done, right? That's gonna move the needle for security because doing that takes sort of, it, it, it takes defense against the things above, the threat actions that they take, the patterns that they use. Uh, having strong boundary defenses, making sure that your network has a, you know, a good fence around it, as it were, um, will, 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 will stop many of the external actors, right? Now, if, if this number were bigger for internal, you might have a totally different set of top controls down there at the bottom. And secure configurations, that leads back to the sort of the errors, right? Um, it has to do with um, the, the cloud. So this report really teaches you how to fish. Right. Uh, instead of giving you the fish, it, it teaches you how to fish and, and how to, and I mean that, you know, the allegory or whatever that is, the, the metaphor, but um, to help yourself and to now you can scope your program. One more example of how the DBIR does this, healthcare. Um, several hundred um, confirmed data disclosures. You can see that internal actors were almost half, right? So why does that happen in, in healthcare settings? Um, because um, financial, I'm sorry, uh, healthcare information is highly monetizable. Sometimes people are just curious and they want to see if their ex-spouse still has that malady that they want to see if they're getting treated for or their mother-in-law is still in rehab or something. Um, the curiosity is a real factor there. Um, but also, you know, <clears throat> business processes, like I said, lost taxes and such. Um, so as an example, any industry that I mentioned earlier, those 20 industries, no matter which one you're in, you can look in this report and see who the bad guys mostly are, what actions that they mostly take, web applications being one of them, the kind of data they go after, and then the controls, the controls that you need to um, put into place. You can see in healthcare, 
Security training and boundary defense are very important, just like they were in the other one, but data protection is a different um, control that you need to put into place in this industry because the attack patterns are different. That just means that you need to encrypt better or you need to limit access to, to sensitive data to, to certain people. Not everybody should be able to get into that database. So the DBIR is, is a great tool for, as I said, sort of scoping your program. And this year, for the first time, we broke it out by small, medium business, as well as large enterprises. Um, and this is not meant to you know, sow fear and, 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 and panic, but you just you need to know that as a small or medium business, you are not immune to cyber attacks. And the report talks about you know, the, the, the threat profile against, um, and the attack profile, excuse me, against um, small, medium business in general. Financial, legal, regulatory, reputational risk can all happen. Um, you can find yourself fined, you can find your name ruined, and you can find yourself in trouble with uh, regulators depending on what area you're in. Um, but <clears throat> again, the report helps you um, scope out you know, what efforts you want, or if you have a third party doing this for you, you can sit down with them and say, look, this is what Verizon's research has shown. These guys are, have been doing this for 20 years. How, is, how are the security services that I'm paying you to provide for me calibrated and aligned with this insight? Are you trying to, you're, you're sp speaking to a third party now, who maybe you outsource security to, and you say to them, are you trying to do everything all the time equally, or are you focusing your efforts on the things that matter most? And for me, that's the big takeaway from today. But it's not just the DBIR, we've got a number of other reports um, that we put out that have kits and tools and stuff for you to, to look at. So the insider threat, as I mentioned earlier, a significant threat in all organizations, some more than in others, the kind of um, threat actor, as we call them, is either a careless worker who's misusing assets, lost a laptop, uh, you know, lost a cell phone, wasn't encrypted. Uh, the inside agent, someone who's stealing information on behalf of outsiders. It sounds TV-like or movie-like, but people get compromised and they get, uh, they get, they get you know, incented to steal information. People who are gonna quit or people who are gonna get fired. Uh, so, you know, some organizations, when they're going to do a layoff, you know, they take pains to limit the access to the ability to copy files to USB devices, those little thumb drives. A disgruntled employee who is, is angry about their annual review or, or didn't, get that, um, didn't get that promotion and they're making threats, they can wreak a lot of havoc uh, on systems. And that's, that's a kind of a, um, an actor that you need to know about as well. A malicious insider, somebody who's stealing information for personal gain. Um, somebody who, again, they might be quitting and they, they want to steal the competitive information, the pricing information and such, right? And then third parties, who I mentioned earlier, can, can, can wreak havoc as well. And it's not for, for you to say, I don't trust anybody. And anybody in the cubicle next to me or on the other side of a Zoom call that I work with is an evil person. But what it means is that you have to understand that through their actions or their inactions or, their, their, or, the, or the things that they are asked to do but aren't secure, they can bring security issues. The Insider Threat Report gives you some really great tools to help you um, practice uh, and identify um, some of the issues. There's a, there's a, there's a guide to um, starting an insider threat plan. Um, there's a, there's, a, there's a, uh, some content in there for IT security awareness to help people you know, be smarter about this, particularly business managers to help them understand business processes or behaviors that might lead to insider threat. So these, these, this report comes with, um, you know, the, tool, the tools to really start to look at insider threat programmatically. Uh, I'm gonna move to the payment security report. No doubt many of you are involved in um, processing payments. Uh, we all like the Kaching and uh, the, the payment card industry who issues the um, credit cards and such, they have very high standards for digital uh, security. Um, the PCI compliance is something that you need to demonstrate annually um, to those issuers. Um, and show that your security program is taking into account and protecting the data of your customers and their card, the card information, their payment information. The payment security report we put out every year now for 10 or 11 years, it has grown in influence. And again, written for regular people, written for people who have some responsibility or accountability for um, the compliance. As a business owner, a business leader, you may certainly not be involved in the day-to-day -day of a PCI we call it a QSA, what is it, a qualified security assessment. You may not be involved in, in that, but you might sign off on it or you might you know, pay, pay for one. And this report can help you understand um, how the very challenging standard, right, can, can, can make organizations either you know, fail or succeed. Uh, the report gets into um, you know, some of the COVID impacts on the 
payment card industry. And I want to move ahead a little bit quickly so we make sure we have time for questions. But um, it talks about some of the strategic um, data security traps that you could fall into um, when it comes to managing um, PCI, PCI security, payment card security. What's interesting is the report also breaks down. We love our graphs here at Verizon, but you know, different industries do a better job. The big takeaway from this report uh, is that most organizations on the day or the week of the month that they get assessed or evaluated for compliance are not compliant. Um, they have gaps in their controls. Um, their, their, their ability to demonstrate full compliance with the DSS standards is not there. Uh, some do it better than others, but it's amazing to see that, you know, in retail, you know, less than 20% are on any given day compliant. Uh, financial services, 28% are compliant. Um, and the report gets into the reasons why. Um, the, before I talk to this, it, it really gets down to the control level. Um, each, each of the control areas in the standard demands certain capabilities. Um, and the report shows you where most organizations don't have those or they have weak capabilities there. Fundamentally, the goal of the of PCI compliance, as you can see, is, is about developing a program. And I always use the word capital P program um, and not just treating PCI security compliance as a one thing you do once a year and move on. You can't take shortcuts with security. And that, again, that contributes to your resiliency, your ability to, to move to a new payment system, contactless payments or work with the vendor to bring in innovative new technologies to, to, to uh, do secure payments in the light of weird happenings like COVID. Um, the mobile security report came out earlier this year. Um, we looked at and surveyed close to a thousand organizations about how they treat mobile security. This report came out about two weeks before, you know, the mid, mid end March. It was very well timed. We didn't know COVID was coming, but it certainly provided insight what we found, the headline here is in this report, is that a lot of organizations um, rely on security, I'm sorry, rely on, on mobile devices to run their business. A lot of organizations um, uh, say that it's central to it, but most organizations admitted that they cut corners when it comes to mobile security. It's not a priority for them. They think that it's secure enough. The report talks about um, some of the, some of the, you know, uh, some of the insight that we found everyone's a target when they have mobile devices, of course. But what I want to get to the guts of here is, is that, you know, we, this was a survey and, you know, when you ask somebody a survey uh, in a survey, some uncomfortable questions, I, you know, I tend to like downplay it. So these people were pretty open, uh, which tells me that um, you know, the problem might even be bigger, but of the, of the, the, the close to a thousand organizations we, we surveyed, you know, two thirds of them said that they had suffered some kind of a compromise that came through a mobile device. 55% uh, of them said that they were experiencing uh, you know, lasting repercussions. Um, so you, you want to look at your mobile device security separately as well as integrated with your security program. The report helps you in a couple of ways. Um, <clears throat> customers, I love this statistic, 87% of respondents were concerned about the impact of a breach on customer loyalty. Your customers can turn around and go across the street to somebody else if you have a big data breach. 81% 81% said that a company's data privacy record would be a key brand differentiator. Part of the, part of the whole secure, part of the whole experience as a customer is the security aspect of it. Now, the report talks about the four different ways that mobile devices can get attacked. I'm not going to go too deep into this, but it's not just the phone itself. It's, let's just call it a phone, right? A smartphone. It's the user. Are they smart enough not to click on a link that looks like it might be real? We've seen this huge spike in phishing, P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, phishing related to COVID um, in the last few months where, you know, in a phishing attack, you click on a link that looks like it's going to take you somewhere legitimate, but it brings in malware, maybe ransomware. And the bad guys are using, you know, manipulative language. They're, they're you know, click here for the COVID alert in your area. Click here for the latest on the vaccine availability or testing availability. They, 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 they're masters of preying on the anxiety that we have during bad times. And we're in bad times right now. Employees are working from home. They've got their dogs barking in the background. I can't believe my dogs haven't barked yet. They've got their kids wandering in other rooms. They get one eye on their kids because maybe the kids are, are um, you know, doing the school thing on another computer and they're trying to do their own job. Uh, or maybe they have a spouse or a significant other or somebody in their life who's working, um, don't have the luxury of working remotely and they're working on prem when they're worried about them. So the attention to detail, the rush to demonstrate to your, your boss that you are you know, engaged all the time makes you more susceptible to clicking on a phishing link. So users need to be educated. But then, you know, mobile devices are applications. 
And I don't know if you understand, sometimes you pull down an app and like, why does my banking um, application, you know, for my mobile, mobile banking, why does it need access to my camera and my, and my voice? We'll share the camera so I can take a picture and do mobile, uh, you know, mobile depositing. But, you know, some applications ask for all of these permissions on your phone. They want to track your, um, track your movements and they want access to your camera and your microphone and all those things. Know that if you are doing company issued devices, you should have control and visibility into the applications that you either allow or not allow your employees to put on there. You know, it's not just about the productivity if they pull down a Netflix or a social media thing. It's the dangers that can come from the applications uh, themselves that can provide a tunnel into your network. The devices, whether or not they're actually, you know, if you lose a device, can you wipe one remotely? Can you swipe it and wipe it and have it not be pick, picked up and, 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 you know, people can look at it? If someone loses a laptop, you know, do you have the ability to wipe it from there or encrypt it? Um, so when they do leave it on a train somewhere, someone picks it up, they can't get into it. And then, of course, the network security as well back at, back at the home base. So, you know, the, the report helps you get your head around, particularly if you are overly reliant or increasingly reliant on um, on mobile devices. Uh, there's also a great tool in this mobile security index called an acceptable user policy development kit. An acceptable, sorry, an acceptable use policy. Acceptable use policy is something that I as an employee would be asked to pledge to behave. And you may already do this, but it's something that basically says, I promise that I will not use my device to, you know, look at websites that bring in, you know, the, the bad, bad content, create a hostile environment, uh, that suck up bandwidth. I'm not going to, you know, watch uh, March Madness on my company issued tablet and bring down the network. You know, I'm not going to go to other sites that have questionable content uh, or or malicious content. It's one thing for me to sign that piece of paper. It's another thing for an organization to implement and enforce those that policy through technology. And that's something that you need to be thinking about as well. This stuff is super super expensive, maybe, and it, and it can be. But it's it's the way that you control the costs around this again is go back to the beginning. Um, about about understanding what's likely to happen, what your threat profile is, what your what your risk profile is, um, and, and what your appetite is, and 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 prioritize, really prioritize. Um, we'll come back to that question in a minute. So, another report that we that we put out is the incident preparedness and response report. I think this is one of the most important reports that we put out in the last year or two. Um, this report, see, Verizon does hundreds and hundreds of. Uh, consultant, consulting gigs with companies that um, need to get their incident response plan in order. Um, we looked at hundreds and hundreds of incident response plans, IR plans from our customers. And these are plans that, you know, you may have one yourself. It's sort of the disaster plan or, or the incident response plan. If this happens, here's what we do. Here's who you call. Here's who's in charge of this. It's beyond a phone tree, but maybe a phone tree is part of that, right? In this report, we saw that an incredible number of organizations um, were not ready. They do not have a plan like this. Now, this is a little bit too homeworky for me and for this for this today. But know that having a plan does take you know several steps. There's a method or a methodology for building a plan. We looked at the the, diff, the maturity of the plans in many of, our, of the organizations, and what we found is that most of them, quite frankly, are a little bit delusional. They, they think their plans are a lot better than they are. So if you, have a, if, if you don't have a plan, you've got to make a plan. And the plan has to take into account and ask those tough questions. What if this happens at three o'clock in the morning? What do we do? And those what ifs are scenario based. What if we get hit by a ransomware attack? Do we want to pay it? Should we pay it? Should we not pay it? Do we have a policy? Who gets to decide that? Do we decide that in advance? If we're going to pay it, how much is enough? How much is too much? Is $5,000 too much? Is $10,000 too much? You have to have these conversations. If we're not going to pay it, what's our plan to resume operations if we're not going to pay it? Do we have a workaround? Do we have backups? Are we, are we going to make a public statement and say we refuse to pay? Or are you going to, make it, you're going to pay it and, and not make a statement at all? These are the conversations you want to have you know, on a Friday morning with donuts and coffee and the right people in the room and not at three o'clock in the morning when you're pulling your hair out because you can't believe this is happening. Um, the, 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 the other things that we found in, in the review of the security incident response plans was Many organizations don't practice their plan. At least once or twice a year, you've got to practice your plan. You're going to take it off the shelf, make sure that the phone numbers are up to date. Maybe three or four people aren't with you anymore, and you've got to update those phone numbers and names. What we find when we do what we call these tabletop exercises, Verizon goes into a lot of companies and sits down with executives and, and leaders, and, and we run a scenario and say, okay, this, this happened. Uh, 50,000 credit card um, records were stolen. 
What are we going to do? First of all, who's, who's, who's responsible for that? And everybody in the room points at each other because it's not my fault. Um, and when you, when, you know, when you do that during sort of a, an exercise, it's eye opening. But if you're doing that in real time, it can be the end of your company. So it's so important to have the plan. The, this report, this incident preparedness report helps you build out your plan, helps you understand how to do that. We actually have a breach simulation kit in there that's for free, teaches you how to do this stuff yourself. So, you know, again, the report talks about the key takeaways. Everything that we write in these reports isn't just, a, oh, that's interesting. It maps to things that you can do. And please note, it doesn't say things that you can buy from Verizon. It doesn't say the names of our products. It says the key takeaway is that you need to do these things that allow you to um, achieve certain level of capability, which brings us full circle back to these four security capabilities or objectives. Knowing your risk, understanding what's real and what's, what's hypothetical, knowing what's connected to your network and how to protect it, knowing how to detect and respond faster, knowing how to minimize that impact. So this is hopefully a good place to stop, maybe go to some questions, but the sort of the moral of the story is do not get lost in the, the, the gee whiz coolness factor of security and sort of the mystique around security that, that you have to be a, you know, a hacker with a hoodie and, and uh, ride a skateboard to work every day to, to, to understand this stuff. This is, a, this is a business engine and a business enabler, just like any other thing that we have in, in business. Uh, it's a tool, it's a resource, and you just got to figure out how to put it into a business context and make it work for you. So that said, I'm going to maybe stop sharing. Do we want to go back to uh, faces and names here? I'm just so fearful, Paul, that you're going to tell me I was on mute for the whole no, thank, time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, I just had to unmute my mic. It was a really good um, presentation, but even more so a lot of information here. Uh, we did have some people uh, send some information uh, questions on the chat box as well as. So please, if you have questions, please submit them in the uh, Q&A button um, on your screen on the bottom portion of your screen. But we do have some questions. One of the questions is. Um, what would you, advice would you give for people to immediately take uh, take in, you know accountable for as a business owner uh, what they should do immediately at this point um, you know what they gather here but I think you what are some of the immediate steps they could do right now yeah the you know the the, the top critical security controls uh, that's sort of a a, a a touchstone for people in security the, the very first thing that that on that list in the prioritized list is um, knowing your assets, knowing what you need to protect or what could be attacked. And that means actually understanding all the devices and then also understanding where the data is and what kind of data you have. If you have a lot of you know, very sensitive information and you don't know where it is or how it flows, you, know, you don't have that visibility into that asset because data is an asset, um, that's gonna cause problems. If you don't know how many devices you have connected or how many laptops you've issued, that is a, a chain with a lot of weak links. So asset management, asset evaluation is definitely the number one thing. I think the second uh, pressing thing too is, is to um, understand how, um, say uh, it's educated, but how familiar your end users are with their role in security. Again, security training and awareness isn't a once a year thing where you do the online training and click the box and, and then you move along. Um, you've got to develop a culture that has everybody understand that they are part of the chain. Good. Yeah, that's good. Something that we can all look at and start implementing. Um, if you were hit with ransomware, I mean, to get your information back, would you would you pay? Would you advise to pay? What, what are some of the best practices on that? Uh, I, Verizon would be hard pressed to answer that question. So we would defer to uh, law enforcement. Typically, the FBI has said, do not pay. Um, I know from my travels on, on behalf of Verizon, that many cities, uh, Houston included, um, have a strong presence for the FBI and other uh, federal law enforcement agencies who are willing to come in when things are going well <laughs> and help you understand what your options are should something go bad. Um, so highly advise um, folks to you know, think about the resource there that, that they have in the federal law enforcement FBI is usually a liaison person who can give you advice. Now that said, it takes you back to what I was saying about the preparedness, right? You have to have those conversations. Are we in such, are we so on thin ice that if we got ransomware, we would just have to pay? Like we, we know that we don't have the backup tapes. We don't have the ability to go on. We're, we're dead in the water. And then you have to say, who, who says that you're allowed to do that? Is it the CFO? Is it the CEO? And I'm also just fascinated by the mechanics of it. If they want $10,000 in Bitcoin, you know, where do you get it? Who, I mean, where's that $10,000 going to be moved from or to? 
Um, but you know, those are the kind of conversations you have to have against. But I personally, yeah, we, I mean, on behalf of Verizon, we can't really advise either way, but I would say defer to law enforcement's advice. Don't okay. do it. No, no. Uh, yeah. I think that's a good advice from that perspective. Big, big, big uh, risk right there. So that, that's something that you want to get some. Uh, it's a tough one. Similar. Yeah. Um, so another question that came in and I'm going to try to uh, understand this question. Uh, does the, uh, is it, the cell phone or ISP company accountable for their privacy, this client's privacy information? Um, is that something that we need to be, to understand? And I think this is coming from a personal, not necessarily a business standpoint, but what, what are your take on that um, in, in that for their well, information? Both, so both business and personal. I mean, it, it, if, if, if you as company X rely on a company like a Verizon or another provider to provide network or to provide you know cellular service, whatever, um, that company has obligations to protect data, customer data, your data, your company's data um, to a certain degree, right? They have to um, make sure that um, some random person can't call up and pretend to, uh, you know, maybe cry and say, I need, I need that, that password because, you know, my, my husband's sick and I need that. We get trained extensively on not to do that, right? But in the larger sense, when you think about things like cloud security or, or, or any other service provider who's helping you secure your organization, you have to be clear on who's responsible for what. And those words, responsible, accountable, they're not interchangeable. You have to really have that, that understanding of, you know, if you go to an Amazon or Microsoft or any other cloud provider, they don't do 100% security for you, with you on your behalf. And they don't guarantee 100% because there are things that you are obligated to do. You have a responsibility to do certain things. So know that know what your role is, know what your responsibility is. But yeah, most providers contractually will say what they are responsible for and what they're not. And we certainly recognize that personal data is a rich target. We do everything we can to protect that. Okay. And that's good to know. Um, and, and another um, attendee wrote, um, and this is catered to Verizon, um, because you guys are a, a lot in doing protecting your customers and, and you guys are also an internet provider, ISP. Um, do you have the ability to help to detect threats for your customers? Is that something that? Um... Yeah, and it sounds like the police are coming to get me. I didn't do anything wrong, I swear. Um, no, what we, um, but I think there's two answers to that question. Um, one is, as a service provider to companies, Verizon helps organizations protect their assets. We provide a lot of managed services, professional services, monitoring services. We alert companies that, that hire us to do this, that there's some suspicious activity going on, that they need to do X, Y, and Z to protect themselves or we'll protect them for them. Um, so, so we provide that as a service to, to many companies. Now, if, if I'm understanding the question too, um, as, a, as an individual, um, yeah, yeah, obviously, I think, uh, as I said earlier, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of control and training in place to make sure that personal data doesn't get, doesn't get compromised. Um, but yeah, we, I think more, more toward that, that managed security services that we offer a lot of companies, a lot of companies know what they need to do. Maybe they have some people who do it part-time, half-time, or even full-time or, or more than a few people, but programs have gaps and, and we can help organizations fill those gaps in. Okay. And, and thank you for, for, uh, just that, that aspect of answering that question. Sure. Um, here's another one. Uh, what cell phone security apps do you recommend? You know, everyone's now having a, a mobile device. And, and so how do you protect that? Uh, and is that, should you implement a policies that every um, employee on their phones have these particular apps that can help protect uh, their- Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the two factor authentication, you know, to make sure that before you're connecting to a network, you know, you are who you say you are, um, that, that virtual private network, um, the VPN that, that has become so in need, uh, particularly as, you know, you went from having 10% of your workforce working remotely to 100% or 80% or something. Um, if, if you go back to the mobile security index, that report, that report does a much better job than I can right now explaining um, how you can mitigate those, those risks. And you saw, and remember I went through sort of the, the user and the application and the, and the device itself and the network. The report really explains that in, in layman's terms about um, the security controls that you can and should put on. And they're not usually, the report doesn't usually name a, a product. It names a capability that you can then go find the product would do. We like to keep it, uh, like it non-specific uh, to, uh, to brands and more about you know, the power of, of the technology. 
yeah, best practices in that perspective. Yep. Uh, before we continue more of the question, could you share how they can download these uh, templates or these resources? Yeah, sure. Um, in fact, I can pull up another slide in a minute. Um, I hate to put you on a, on a, on a wild goose chase, but um, if you use your favorite search engine <laughs> um, and, and you, you type in, um, you know, the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report or DBIR or the Insider Threat Report, you, you're going to find those. The, the Verizon Enterprise, so it's www.verizonenterprise, one word, dot com. It's a pretty big site, but we also have a search bar there that you can find these reports on. I wish I had one address to give you, but because we we built we built these sites out that have a lot more than just a report. You can download these reports as a PDF, or you can look at them online. You can take a page from the report and send it to somebody else in, in, in HTML. And then we have these other kits and things. So um, I would invite you to come to the VerizonEnterprise.com website and, um, and and poke around, or just use the search engine to get them. Yeah, and we can we can uh, following this we can help post it on our site too. So I, I will get you those links because I have them, and I'm sorry that I, I don't have them right here because there are there are many other reports. And I'm going to give you a, a, a exciting news. In six days, we're releasing a our first espionage report, cyber espionage report. Some industries are more prone to cyber espionage than others, so we're gonna we're gonna get that as well. I'll get you all those URLs. Oh, good, and that's very good. Um, some other questions that, and uh, we do have some time for some other questions. Uh, would you recommend outsourcing cybersecurity in, in part of your your whole uh, plan of IT? Is that something you, you recommend? Well, it's a tough question for me to answer because fundamentally my rise is in the business of selling that stuff, but, so of course, yes. But um, I would say that it's not, a, it's not a yes, no question. It's a, it's a how much can we do ourselves and how much do we wanna do ourselves and how much do we have to do in general? And then do we have the resources to do that? So what I mean by that is some organizations know that they need to do 24 seven monitoring. They have to have somebody looking at the monitor all night, looking for those blinking red lights, making sure that you know, data is not being stolen. You might wanna outsource that because it's hard to hire those people. Nobody wants to work Christmas Eve, midnight to six, midnight to eight. Um, there are elements of a security program that can be very technical, very challenging, very cutting edge that are necessary. Uh, and that expertise is hard to find, can be very expensive to hire. So there are elements of your program. I would go back to the slides that I, that I share with you about those four capabilities, the, the visibility into risk and the ability to protect the attack surface and the ability to detect and, and respond faster. Outsourcing elements of your program is going to greatly enhance it. I would not rush into, a, um, into just abdicating it all. In fact, I wrote a white paper, and this is not, you didn't know this. I wrote a white paper about outsourcing early this year and some of the, um, some of the considerations that you should have, some of the conversations you should have internally when you're considering this. So I will send you a link to that as well if you, if you folks want to read that. It's not trying to persuade you to outsource everything. It's trying to help you uh, ask the right questions uh, of yourself, of your organization, and of the potential person that you're going to hire to do. So we'll okay. get you that as well. Yeah, and it's kind of related. Would you what would you say your budget be? How would you put your budget for that type of thing? Well, that's, that's not a million dollar question. <laughs> that's a terrible way to answer. Um, that's that's a question that vexes a lot of security professionals because there's no one answer. It's never ten percent of your IT budget. It's not twenty percent of your overall spend. Um, it, it 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 has to be in line with your risk appetite, in line with your understanding of the risks uh, and the threats against you, in line with the potential. Um, impact to your business operations. Um, it may sound like a lot of money to spend on a, on a, on a certain security uh, device. Um, but I'm just making this number up $100,000. That's crazy. But if, if you have a denial of service attack and your website is knocked offline for two days, how much revenue are you going to lose? Can you put those on a relative scale and do the math, right? If we lose, you know, $10,000 a day and we're gone for three days and this device costs $10,000, you know, that weighs out pretty well. There really is no one answer, um, and any any provider who tells you there is is just looking for a percentage. Um, it, it is about um, it's it's like car shopping. You got to figure out you know what you want, what you don't want, what the extras are, and 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 to pay for the things that you really do need. It's kind of a tough answer for a tough question. Yeah, and and thank you because everyone's different, but I just that's how much risk you want to do. It's just like buying insurance too, right? In that perspective. Um, yeah. Well, just last question, and this, this, I wanted to say this because it's happened to one of my good friends, uh, SIM swapping. Uh, it's been mm. a, a new trend. Uh, it's been something that happened. It ruined his uh, credibility, but even more so because he was managing uh, several, several servers and whatnot. So that that they got his mobile number and they, they SIM, SIM swapped and whatnot. 
So, and he had it took a long time to repair his credit history because they took bank oh, account numbers. Sorry to hear that. Uh, no, and so what is your your advice and what are you seeing as a cybersecurity person, the trend and how to protect, how was one protect himself from SIM swapping? Yeah, and, that, that, swapping and, and whatnot? yeah I mean, yeah, the, we, the mobile security index talks a lot about SIM swapping and about how uh, that can cause the kind of problems you just described. Uh, a lot of this is being um, taken care of at the technology level. A lot of the, the, the handset developers are, are putting into place technologies to, to minimize or mitigate that or even, even make that impossible. Um, given the amount of time we have to talk about, I can't really get into it, but I would advise you to take a look at the mobile security index. It goes pretty deep on the SIM swapping, um, but it tells you that bad guys are creative, bad guys are motivated, bad guys can really wreak havoc and then they move on and we have to live with the repercussions. And it's, it's, it, it is sad and it's, it's frustrating, but it is part of doing business, just like, you know, just like insurance for, for your company or uh, your monitors for your, your plumbing to make sure the pipes don't burst overnight, things like that. It's just it's part of doing business. So take a look at those reports, please. Okay, great. So um, with that, I know we're about time to wrap up. So as we wrap up, you know, I want to say thank you, David. You did an amazing job oh, um, providing all this, this webinar and, and just wonderful resources that we'll also post online. Um, also, I just want to remind you next Wednesday in our event, exclusive speed networking cocktail party, uh, get dressed up, meet people, interact, uh, meet like-minded business owners and entrepreneurs. So if you haven't signed up, we do have a limited number of space and slots. So uh, please look on our website and to find more information um, and please register. The last Can thing... The last thing, oh, thank you for that. And here's the, uh, David's contact information. But if you're not in our newsletter, please sign up as well and stay connected. Um, we also want you to follow us on social media on the top, and we can find those links on the top of our portion of our website. Again, thank you for spending this afternoon with us. Please reach out to the chamber if you have any questions. We're happy to help. Um, hope to see you at some future webinars and our networking event. David, thank you so much, National Janet, National Ace. Um, and thank you for spending our, our afternoon with us. Um, this concludes our webinar, so we'll be ending the meeting shortly. I appreciate your time, and I uh, appreciate it. Have a good, have a good rest of the afternoon. Thanks, Paul. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.